Welcome to Sinister Heroes. I'm your host, Danny Iniquitous. Thank you for tuning in. Today's episode, we're going to talk about the Way of the Ascended Dragon Monk. This is a new subclass that came out in Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons. So there's a lot of cool things to unpack here. It's new, so we got to see exciting things that we haven't seen before. It has to do with dragons, so we'll see what kind of things this comes up with. Uh, if you like what we do here, please like, share, subscribe, comment. We love engaging with you guys. It's it's very cool to see your ideas. You're very, very smart, the guys that we've been talking to. Um, so very grateful for all of that. Uh, so we're going to jump into what a monk is and some of the popular concepts people have about the monk and our opinions about that. The Monk class, it's gotten a lot of negative press because of the way it's designed. People don't think it deals enough damage and it gets overshadowed by other classes that basically do the same function. And I don't think that's really true. I think there's a lot of strength in the Monk. I think a lot of the times people don't, they don't really see it because they're so focused on how to compare it to other classes. And when you're a martial class or you're an upfront and like fighter that does physical damage, everyone compares you to the fighter. I happen to love the fighter. I think it's like an incredible class, but the monk is not a fighter. Where the fighter is supposed to be very iron wall like. You move up to a point and you basically hold that line. That's kind of what a fighter does. A monk isn't really built for that. A monk, you really have to use that movement speed that you're gained and really try to try to really abuse it every chance you get. Because of that great movement speed and the availability to use things like Step of the Wind, where you get to take Disengage as a bonus action, you can move very, very far, very quickly. And this is a great setup because it's for attacking weaker um, combatants. It's for attacking those mages or those archers or those people that have to stand behind those lines. Because the monk is built specifically to do a large number of attacks, because at level 1 you have... Um, your martial arts ability that gives you a bonus action to attack and you add your attack modifier to it so it's a better form of two weapon fighting and you get it right off the bat for being a monk so taking that into combat you run in and you start pummeling these things behind lines if it's not a very hard suited person you're going to do a lot of damage to them very very quickly and the availability of flurry of blows helps to extend the actual danger factor of what you do you really want to go after casters because it's a great way to break their concentration on spells because you'll have to make repeated rolls it's bettering your chances to to break that concentration and save a teammate or stop a debilitating effect that's really where the strength of the monk is it's really on a focused standpoint like you really got to get into it you got to be very courageous and be willing to go deep behind the lines because that's what's going to make you really effective um Step of the Wind doubles your jump distance. You can theoretically jump over and around other enemies. So that's a great way to use it. It's important that you use that move speed. Because a lot of people see that and just go, Well, you can just move 30 feet normally with most races. So you're not really getting much. But you really don't understand what that means when you're climbing. And when you're affected by difficult terrain. And you're able to run through that and get to a point to, to help your teammate. Uh, it's a little risky, but again, you got to be courageous to do so. That is the strength of the monk. You get multiple attacks, you get multiple stunning strikes. Yes, you have a resource, but you got to be very, very persistent on using your resource. A lot of people tend to think, oh, I, it's such a few number. I got to I gotta keep them as, as much as possible and, and hold on to them. I don't want to waste them in the point where I don't need them. Burn them. Just, just do it because you. the more you use these abilities, A, the more awesome you'll feel because you're a monk and you get to do these things that nobody else can. And B, you don't want to leave the day with something left in the chamber. And C, if you want to feel like a monk, you got to really take these chances. That being said, uh, I generally don't really find myself being dragged to any particular subclass of the monk. So it's really a little hard for me to, to really get like amped up. But... Now, with the, the Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons, we have a very new um, subclass, and it has a lot of cool things that do it that really, really kind of change the way you would see a monk, and it's a very cool concept. I'm very excited about it. So we're going to jump right into the abilities you get with the Way of Ascended Dragon. 
So when you select this subclass at level 3, it gives you a couple of cool options as to how you gain these abilities or you trained under a dragon or what brought you to this kind of type of fighting style or martial art. Uh, again, it's one of those things where like it's heavily influenced that you had a lot of schooling and monastatic traditions to do this because it's the monk class. You don't really have to follow that to the T. You can just say you were raised by dragons and they taught you how to fight based on the limits of your form, of your physical form. That being said, it's pretty cool. Uh, right off the bat, you get Draconic Disciple. Uh, at third level, you can channel Draconic Power to magnify your presence and imbue your unarmed strikes with the essence of Dragon's Breath. You gain the following benefits. Uh, one is Draconic Presence. If you fail a Charisma Intimidation or Charisma Persuasion check, you can use your reaction to re-roll the check as you tap into the mighty presence of dragons. Once this feature turns into a failure into a success, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. You can use this every time until you succeed with it. You're not really a Charisma class and there will be times where you need to make that Persuasion check or you might need to make that Intimidation check. It's good to have a free reroll. Uh, that's really what it is. And it can change the course of what's going on. It gives you an opportunity to do that. And you don't have to super heavily invest in charisma. Uh, especially if you don't have a charisma caster. Or that person is incapacitated. Or you're fighting for that person's survival. Uh, this is a great way to do that. It's not as important as some of the other things you'll get. Uh, it is great to have a reroll. It's basically advantage on a check until it works. Uh, so keep it in your back pocket. Use it every time you can. Don't worry too much about it. It's a good way to feel that draconic aura that is incorporated with dragons. Anything that has a dragon has this like powerful, intimidating presence. And it's reflectant in everything. And it's nice to see that they keep that continuity with everything. Uh, the second ability is Draconic Strike. When you damage a target with an unarmed strike, you can change the damage type to Acid, Cold, Fire, Lightning, or Poison. I started drooling when I saw Poison. Uh, I love the damage type, though I know it is heavily uh, not good to use. Uh, but you're a varying human, maybe use the Poisoner feet as your uh, feet of choice. And here you go, you're literally hitting people with Poison. Uh, I love Love that theory. I love the way it just it tastes and feels so good. Uh, again, I'd probably try and talk to my DM, see if I can incorporate that with my uh, my weapons of choice, and then I could finally wield the poison dagger I've been dreaming about since uh, the day I was born. Uh, so it's, it's cool. I like it. It's very effective. If you're a kind of person that's worried about damage types, you can switch it. It does not say that it has to be permanent. You can switch it whenever you want. It says when you damage a target with an unarmed strike, you change the damage type. So if you're fighting a lot of stuff that's immune to lightning, switch it up to acid, cold, fire, whatever it is, it gives you options. And it's great because you get it at level three. So even if you have to wait till your higher level to get your fist to be considered magical weapons, you still overcome that really early. So take that into consideration. It's a very, very good good boost especially if you find yourself in an area where you weren't supposed to be maybe you and your party walked into a higher level area than the than the module or campaign had you know presented for you and you're in a situation where you're nobody else is hitting hard and it's mainly because no one has magic weapons or the availability to overcome resistances that's your moment to be a hero you know like you can do a lot with that and it's cool to be smart and to be like to incorporate what that means for your character. Maybe you were trained by a specific dragon, but because of it, you learn to incorporate all these different aspects. And maybe that can be like a focal point. Maybe that could be something about your character class or your character that has a connection to, to different types of dragons. Or maybe they're completely insane and they have multiple personalities and each one is associated with a different dragon type. And you can use that to kind of reflect on your personality and switch in between them like i like being creepy i like being weird having an acid voice in my head spewing like these dark things making me do these things 
I, I'm in, you know, I'm sold. Like, I think you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. And the fact that it can seep through your pores and become this gross, like, like hit, like this, like this wet meat smacking sound hitting, hitting a golem, you know, like it's, it's, it's cool and it's gross. And I really, really, really love it. Uh, the third ability you get from Dr Draconic Disciple is Tongue of Dragons. You learn to speak, read and write Draconic or one other language of your choice. Take Draconic, it, it just, there's no reason for you not to. It makes sense, it feels good. Uh, you might not encounter Draconic as often as you would like, but it is kind of who you are. So uh, I, I would stick to it just to be fully dedicated, but it's, it's one of the cooler things is the fact that you get Draconic Strikes and it's just, as a standalone ability, great. The fact that you get ad, like advantage on a intimidation check, like that's awesome because I like being scary. So. There is another ability you get at level 3, and we're going to talk about that right now. The other ability you gain at level 3 is Breath of the Dragon. Uh, I'm surprised you get this so early, because, I mean, obviously you were expecting to get some sort of Dragon Breath ability, but to get it right off the bat when you pick this, very cool. Uh, this is a good one, so just wait. A lot of people might be a little confused as to why it's so great but i'll get into that uh at third level you can channel destructive waves of energy like those created by the dragons you emulate when you take the attack action on your turn you can replace one of the attacks with an exhalation of draconic energy in either a 20 foot cone or a 30 foot line that is five foot wide you make that choice you also choose the damage type which would be acid cold fire lightning or poison each creature in that area must make a dexterity saving throw against your key save DC, taking damage of the chosen type equal to two rolls of your martial arts die on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. At 11th level, the damage of this feature increases to a roll of three of your martial arts die. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. While you have no uses available, you can spend two key points to use this feature again. Kind of a lot to go through, but first and foremost, you pick the damage type. Very useful, just be wary when the DM says that this damage didn't do what you expected or, or, or whatever way your DM hints at resistances and immunities. Outside of that, you can choose a 20 foot cone or a line. I choose a cone almost 90% of the time because you have a greater chance of hitting more people. Now at level three, your martial arts die is 1d4. So 2d4 might not sound like a lot because a regular two handed quarter staff will do 1d8 plus your modifier. So is the damage really there? Yes, because you're doing it in an AoE, and a 20-foot cone is a huge AoE. Uh, a lot of the times, you will not have an option to do AoE damage as a martial fighter, just generally speaking. But hitting a large group of people, say you hit one person with a quarter staff and you did 10 points of damage. If you hit five people and you did three points of damage you did 15 damage across the board and i know taking out a creature is more beneficial because you can do the same amount of damage potentially at love with one hp that you could with full hp but whittling down your opponents is important also you will not get to a point where you'll kill everything in one shot most of the time it's just not going to happen outside of the really early levels but Whittling down your opponents, especially when you have something that they have difficulty coming through, or maybe they're coming through a funnel, shooting that out every couple of turns will do a lot of damage, and it will help to mitigate what they can do. You want to do as much damage as possible, I get that. At 11th level, it's going to be 3d8. A lot of the times, people are going to be like, well, I could just do this and add this and do more damage to one target. Yeah, again, you can hit multiple targets. It does require your wisdom because of your key. So I understand that as, a, as an issue. But it's not, re, it's not costing your key points until you've burned all of your proficiency bonuses. 
to do it. So you have a lot of options and you can replace an attack with it. When you're at fifth level, you can attack twice and then burn a whole area. So you do get a lot of opportunities to use this and add it to the damage. People look at this and they think of it just as a once and it's like once an attack. It's not what it is. It's no longer that the way it was when the, uh, the Dragonborn had it in the player's handbook. You attack once with your quarter spat, maybe, or whatever it is you're using, hit that, add your modifier, and then throw the breath, and you're adding this on top of that damage. It is important that you see it that way, as not just an independent attack, but as part of your combat prowess. Like, you're punching, and then you just turn around and you're just spewing breath. And as long as you take the attack action, you get to bonus action your martial arts, so... You're still hitting at least two times, and you're still being able to hit a huge amount of area with this. Don't negate this because of the martial arts die being relatively small. I get it, 3d10 at like the end isn't going to be wildly impressive, but when you can see what you can do in conjunction with the other attacks you're making, that's where it comes in, and that's where the availability comes into it. So don't think it's really like not as worth it. It's a very exciting ability. It's designed this way to be used somewhat regularly. You get a lot of uses with your proficiency bonus. And then if you still want to use it again, you can use your key points, which is great because it will extend your availability to do so. At 6th level, you gain Wings Unfurled. This is an interesting one, I gotta say. I didn't expect this kind of a mechanic uh, when I was first looking through it, but I am pretty impressed with its implications. If it works like this, if you use your Step of the Wind, which gives you the availability to do a disengage or a dash as a bonus action for the cost of one key point, and it doubles your jumping distance, you can unfurl Spectral Draconic Wings from your back that vanish at the end of your turn. While the wings exist, you have flying speed equal to your walking speed. Uh, and you can use this the number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Now, again, you can use Step of the Wind and not use this ability. So, Wings Unfurled isn't automatic. You do have to choose to do this. Flying speed is interesting. Um, specifically because if you do fly up there and hit something with Stunning Strike... That is a long way to go down. Um, but as an escape or a maneuverability, it's very, very useful because, again, if there's an iron wall of troops blind blocking something that you have to save or someone that's devastating your team with like spells or something, now you can just fly over it. And you get increased move speed, so it matches your move speed. So you have a lot of distance you can cover. And if you use this and you're not in melee range of anybody you don't need to use the disengage action so you can use the bonus action for dash which increases your speed so you can go even further while flying it's an escape it's a great way to pursue somebody it's a great way to overcome obstacles it's a great way to to overcome combat mechanics that might be very difficult for you and your party it's so tactical of a point that it's a little unusual considering the monk is basically run up and fight and run away uh you know and like do things in an intermittent kind of a fashion because you're not really designed to be frontline as a monk and this gives you availability to supersede a lot of the limitations of movement uh because of flying and because of what step of the wind does it's one of those things, the more creative you are, the smarter you of a tactician you are, the better this ability will be for you. If you're not that creative or tactical, when you need to fly, you'll at least have the opportunity to do so, and that can be very beneficial. Specifically, if you're infiltrating, maybe you have to climb up somewhere, maybe you have to go over a wall and drop a bridge or something or whatever. This will give you the availability to do that. Importantly, this will give you the availability to do that with someone else so you're not stranded in case things go wrong or you can escape again. Uh, tactical, yes. Wildly impressive, not really. But again, at fifth level, you get extra attacks. So you're attacking three times unless you're doing something specific with your bonus action that isn't martial arts. Um, and your attacks are magical, so you're overcoming resistance, and on top of that, you can attack with just acid damage. So there's a lot of cool things you can do that you already have built into your kit at level 5, 
so don't worry too much about this not being such a giant boost to your damage or anything like that because a lot of the things in this kit especially specifically at this point the monk is really really dangerous the monk does a lot of damage at this point so don't worry about your damage you're really competing very well if you're not leading most of your party at this point at 11th level, you gain access to Aspect of the Worm. This is very cool because it incorporates one of my favorite things. Uh, so, the text reads, The power of the Traconic Spirit now radiates from you, warding your allies or inspiring fear in your enemies. As a bonus action, you can create an aura of Draconic power that radiates 10 feet from you for one minute. For the duration, you gain one of the following effects of your choice frightful presence when you create this aura and as a bonus action on subsequent turns you can choose a creature within the aura and the target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your key save dc or become frightened of you for a minute the target can repeat the saving throw at the end of its turns ending its effect on itself on a successful save love frightened Love the fact that it's a 10 foot radius that you can inspire because if they're melee and they don't have anything reach, they cannot come forward, period, until they make that save. That might buy you some time to focus down something else and to keep them occupied in an area. I love Frightened. If you have a Conquest Paladin with you, ooh, did you just make a friend for life? Uh, second ability you can get is resistance. Choose a damage type when you activate the aura, acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. You and your allies have resistance to that damage. If you're fighting something that you happen to know has fireball or a specific damage type or a, a strong caster that's doing specifically elemental damage, you can pick one of these and it will be a great uh, boon to your party. It's going to increase survivability a lot. So if you're clustered and you get hit by a fireball, it's going to be significantly less detrimental, uh, especially if there's no way to escape it. It's a great bonus. Now, once you create the order, you cannot create it again until you finish a long rest or until you use three key points to create it again. You're at 11th level, so you do have 11 key points. You would have to choose this when you see fit. The important thing to know is this does not cost anything to activate the first time. You can just use it. That is a very interesting point because you have this availability to use it as a clutch skill when you need it and not to worry about the ramifications. So when you just get this skill, you wanna try it out, but you don't wanna be in a situation where you're just done because you don't really practice, you know, in, in Dungeons and Dragons. It's a great way to use that and not feel like linked to it, like or like you wasted the opportunity to, because you can do it again if you need to, but it's a safe way to kind of use it. Uh, so that way you're not feeling like you've expended your only move for a while. Uh, I love Frightened love it there aren't any specific writers additional to it so it's just going to suffer the same kind of effects of the frightened condition which is fine by me i like being scary uh and again the resistance speak for themselves and it's a great way and it lasts a minute for a combat that's a long time and there's no concentration for it you just have it it's just going it's a great way to endure a lot of hardships specifically if you're in areas that you know are going to suffer particular effects like if you're in the nine hells you expect a lot of fire or if you're in like a lava pit or something you expect fire you know if you're in the like the ice wind dale like you're going to expect a lot of cold uh you can use these to mitigate them and it's not metagaming because you're literally facing it because you're right there and you have the availability as a bonus action to kind of wait and see when you need to do it because you don't need to prepare it ahead of time at 17th level, your capstone ability for the Way of the Ascended Dragon is Ascendant Aspect. You gain three of the following benefits. Uh, augment Breath. When you use your Breath of the Dragon, you can spend one key point to augment its shape and power. The exhalation of Draconic Energy becomes either a 60-foot cone or a 90-foot line that is 5 feet wide. 
and each creature in the area takes damage equal to four rolls of your martial arts die on a failed save or half as much damage on a successful one. You also gain blindsight. You have blindsight out to 10 feet. Within that range, you can effectively see anything that isn't behind total cover, even if you're blinded or in darkness. Moreover, you can see invisible creatures within that range, unless the, cr the creature successfully hides from you. We'll get into that. <laughs> uh, explosive Fury. When you activate your aspect of the worm, Draconic Fury explodes from you. Choose any number of creatures that you can see within your aura. Each of those creatures must succeed on a dexterity saving throw against your key save DC or take 3d10 acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison damage. Your choice. All right. These are all passives. Uh, you don't really activate them until you choose to activate them. Uh, you know, they just exist. So, Explosive Fury, when you af activate your aspect of the worm, it just happens automatically. You don't have to spend anything to do it. It's a great bonus. It helps. It just increases your damage for using it. So you get a cool, cool feel of this just overwhelming power of a dragon just emerging from you when you tap it in. Like, you can't hold it back. It just happens. Uh, Blindsight. Blindsight is awesome. There's a couple of instances that I've created uh, around being able to use Blindsight and how that can affect something. It's great. It's useful. When a creature successfully hides from you, it has to beat your stealth check. Your passive perception is pretty high because your wisdom is your secondary stat. So it should be pretty up there, if, especially if you made it up to 17th level. Um, so don't, I'd be pretty hard pressed for anything to really be sneaking by you, invisible. Uh, but it works in darkness and being blind, or even if you're blinded. So being blinded really isn't that detrimental to you anymore. You just have to be within 10 feet of something. The augmented breath. This is interesting. Now, the damage increases, which is great. Uh, the 60 foot cone is huge uh it is a wide area uh, it seems more impressive in number than in actual scenarios but if you do hit that kind of an area where you can use that effectively you're hitting a huge amount of people uh at the same time uh Normally, you really wouldn't be in a scenario where you're taking on an army by yourself, but in case you find yourself here, uh, that's really what you would use that for. Understand one thing about this ability. Because it costs you now one key point to augment it, you're still trading that off of one attack. So you attack, you augment breath, and you can continue to attack. And it's only costing you one key point at level 17 to increase the damage and increase its range. I take it. Uh, I think it'd be very, very worth it, especially if you hit at least two people. Because you're going to be doing 4d10 if you hit and they fail. You know, like, outside of that, like, what do you, your regular attack is doing 15 if you hit max damage. And you, because it's a 1d10 plus your uh, ability modifier, and at 17th level, you definitely should have max dexterity. So 2d10 might hit that. You know, like, there's a lot of vari variabilities, and if one fails, the amount of damage you did for that one attack is huge. It is a large amount, and you can pick the damage type. Again, it's very valuable depending on what you're fighting. Uh, especially if you're fighting anything that has regeneration. Yeah, you're hitting with acid, but there's other things that might get hit that might need to take that acid damage in order to not regenerate HP. This greatly gives you that availability. It, it just makes your dragon breath stronger, and it only costs one key point at 17th level. You know, So there's a lot of space for you to use these key points to do so. So don't fret about spending them now. You've had uh, Dragon's Breath for the whole time that you use basically off your proficiency bonus. And if you were able to use that regularly, you know how effective it can be and how cool it will just feel. Final thoughts on the way of the Ascended Dragon. The cool thing about this subclass particularly is the fact that you gain these abilities that do not require 
you to use your key points in order to use. You can use them based on your proficiency bonus or at least once for free before needing to spend key points to do them again. This really reinforces the normal monk kit because now you have availability to really use uh, Flurry of Blows and Stunning Strike without worrying about having to use your, your subclass to, in order to fulfill the other needs for it. This gives you ability to use your breath regularly. It makes it very, very cool to do so. And you feel like a dragon. You gain these cool abilities. You gain these cool little subtle, subtle things that help you feel more important and more dragon-like and more tied to an element. Or maybe particularly there's one element you like outside of the others and you want to use that regularly. You can do that and you can incorporate that to your character. It really ties in a lot of the monk um, themes really, really well. Uh, and it feels like you're really growing into something because it's another thing where the abilities just keep building, 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 and building, and just getting a little bit better every time. Uh, a lot of that has been happening lately with the subclasses that they've been making them out, especially after Tasha's. So it's a nice, nice incorporation, but what's best about this subclass is it reinforces the abilities. It reinforces the usefulness of Step of the Wind. It reinforces the usefulness of Stunning Strike, and it reinforces the usefulness of Flurry of Blows because it doesn't take away from using those abilities, and it gives you the availability to do these cool things without restricting your availability to do the other ones. Uh, and that's what's really cool about it, because you're now juggling two resources, which isn't very difficult to do, but you're able to do these cool things with them. And you don't have to worry about expenditure, because you're now, like, you gain so much uh, that you have a lot of cool things to do about, so you don't have to worry too much about being one thing or being the other, or just being a class just to be the base class, or, or not being able to use your subclass abilities because the base ones are so important. And it lets you feel like a different monk. This monk feels different than all the other ones. And when you see them in combat and you see them in game, they're going to act differently. And that's what you want out of a subclass. You want to feel like, yeah, it's cool to be a monk, but it's cool to do this other stuff too. And you don't want one to overshadow the other. And this makes a nice little melding of the two of them into a very cool, very complete uh, character class and subclass. So, that being said, I'm all for it. I think it's awesome. I think I can finally make a creepy monk and feel really great about it. Uh, and uh, thank you. If you've made it this far, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, it's very important to us. And thank you for giving the creepy kid a chance.